uh, I'm going to be presenting a webinar here on the developing adolescent brain with regards to education and safety management. Uh, I'm really excited to present. Uh, I'm also really excited to present next week at the conference. Uh, so let's let's get started. Uh, I'd like to say just a little bit about myself. So I grew up in suburban Northeast Ohio, and my mother was a teacher. And this is all background into why I'm interested in this topic. So my mother was a teacher, um, went to the same elementary school that she was teaching at. And I went on to college down, down in Ohio University, and I got my bachelor's in secondary education. And that was after spending some time working at summer camps uh, with this age group. Uh, I also started working for my university program and did some guiding on some rivers and did some wilderness therapy in North Carolina. Uh, I moved all around the country, um, all with this age group, uh, a little bit jumping out and around. And eventually I found a way to merge both the outdoor pursuits that I was really interested in with the education that I'd studied and spent time with, spent time student teaching, um, and ultimately felt like I just really wanted to be outdoors. So I eventually found myself at Outward Bound. Uh, I showed up here in Utah, not really quite knowing what I was showing up to, and really fell in love with the process and spent several years working in the field. And four years ago, I started working in the offices uh, as a program manager, and now I'm an associate program director of course quality and safety. So what that means is that I think about what is our educational curriculum? How can we maximize it? How can we leverage the things that we know about our students so that they're walking away with a changed life in a positive direction, uh, working on leadership, working on character development, and, and a bit, or, uh, being inspired to serve. So after working for several years in the Utah office, uh, I wanted to get myself back in the field. I was missing teaching the folks that, that I had, you know, got really gotten into this profession for. So I actually got in touch with Dan Miller and, and he got me a job working down in Florida with the North Carolina Outward Bound School. And so I've been able to work all over the country uh, working with the, these age groups and I get to be back in the field and actually put my thoughts and, and theories into practice. Uh, I do want to put a disclaimer out. I am not a neuroscientist. Uh, I hope that that was, was made clear by the description. And if that's a problem, you, you know, it's not going to hurt my feelings if, if you were lying on trying to hear from a neuroscientist. Uh, but I work with this age group. And several years ago, I saw some TED Talks. I read some articles. And I got really excited about the teenage brain or the adolescent brain. and the opportunities that, that it allows. So my normal classrooms, as I was talking about, got some, some time in the Everglades. That's with some military veterans um, in Utah on the rivers, underneath the night skies, both the Everglades and all, all of Utah have amazing skies. And this is really, this is really indicative. This is what my classroom tends to look like. So. The webinar is a pretty different venue for me. Uh, I'm not be being able to interact. It's hard for me to move around, or you won't be able to see me if I'm moving around. Um, but I'm really excited for some of the opportunities it does have that you can't do out in the, in the classroom, such as show all these pictures, or out in my normal classrooms. So today, I'll, I'll probably be using the terms adolescent and teenager interchangeably. But I do want you to know that these aren't the same things. Um, teenagers is obviously from age 13 to 19, but what people have been discovering over the last 10 to 15 years with some new technologies, so functional magne magnetic resonance imaging, is that there's a lot of change happening in the brain and it doesn't just limit itself to those teenage years. It starts happening a little bit earlier than the teenage years at the onset of puberty, and that's happening about age 10 for females, age 12 for males. Uh, I, I, would, I would be surprised if you are surprised that there's a difference in maturity between males and females. Um, 
And this, this period goes up to what they say is independence from a caregiver. And so roughly, this is ages 12 to 25. And an interesting fact or interesting thing that studies have been finding is that this independence or that puberty is happening a couple of years earlier worldwide. It's creeping earlier and earlier in, in children's lives. And the independence, having independence from your parents and having uh, control over your own future is happening later and later, five years later since the 1970s. That's impressive. That's five year difference in not, not even two full generations. So it'll be interesting to see these, um, see this adolescent world develop over you know, the next decade or multiple decades over our lifetimes. Uh, so understanding the differences in the brain that are happening this time, I think is gonna be really applicable uh, both now and in the future. So that's a little bit about myself and like Dan was saying, there's a, there's a Google Docs form that we're going to be using a few times throughout the presentation today. And on this Google Doc form, I'm going to pull it up. It's going to show up on your screen, uh, and you'll be able to type on it. Or you'll have to go up to it. I'll pull it up on the screen so it's on the webinar. Um, I'm hoping that you can introduce yourself. Put your name out there. Uh, your profession, if, if your profession doesn't involve working with this age group, what is it that, like, how do you interact? Maybe you're a parent, uh, maybe you're a teacher, maybe you visit your, your children's classrooms, maybe you work in the outdoors. There's a lot of different ways that you could be interacting with this age group. Um, and then if you could put the age of the people you work with. Maybe there might be people who are on the low end of that adolescent, adolescent uh, timeline, or that uh, it could be on the upper end, or you might be working beyond. Um, where you work with, that's just fun to know. And then um, let me pull this up and um, what's an example of reckless or high-risk behavior that you've seen in your line of work your, or your main form of interacting with adolescents? So it looks like Sarah has, has had practices at, at her university and I'm guessing she is uh, an employee at the university, maybe the outdoor program at the climbing wall. Uh, and in the past, they've been able to Aussie repel, which means going off of the back of your harness. Uh, but it seems like this is something that they've tried to change, but people are still trying to, they want to do that despite um, some of the high risk behaviors involved with that. Um, uh, let's see, a lot of stove issues. That's something, uh, whether it's intentional or not. Uh, let's see, some things on a ropes course or a rock wall. Um, oftentimes folks have, have had issues where they unclip, things like that. Um, yeah, and, and I, I like what Deanna's saying, this typical teenage things, drinking, experimenting, pushing independence. That's exactly what we're going to be talking about today, why these things happen. Thanks for sharing. Um, we will come back to that and move forward. So some of the goals of this webinar here. Uh, I, would, I would like for everybody to be able to have a basic understanding of parts of the brain uh, and their general functions. We're not going to go into super deep detail. We will talk about a few individual parts of the brain, um, but not, not really going you know, you won't need to be a neuroscientist to be able to understand. I hope not. Um, also want people to understand that adolescent brains are wired differently. Um, they are a different brain. So instead of thinking, why aren't they using their brains? Realizing that they are using their brains, but they have different brains. Um, and those brains tend to make them be more likely to engage in high-risk activities than either adults or when they were younger as children. I'd also, uh, another goal is exploring ideas to mitigate the danger of these high-risk activities. Uh, so some of these things that we talk about are ways to mitigate. These are also things, you know, they might be things that you are already aware or you might do, but putting them into the context with why they make sense or how they can reinforce what we're talking about. 
And I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, afforded by the structure of the adolescent brain, and we'll get into that. Uh, opportunities that you have with this age group that aren't as strong of opportunities with either younger ages or older ages. Before we move on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to do something. And this is going to be uh, one of the challenges of a webinar, because I'm going to ask you to, uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some words, and I'm going to want you to actually say them out loud wherever you are, you know, if, if you're able to do that, if you're in a, in a place that you can do that. So I'm going to say a phrase. I'm going to want you to repeat each word that I say, and then I'm going to ask a question. And I want you to just, as fast as you can, type in the response to that question. Um, just the first thing that comes into your mind and type it. So first one, I want you to repeat after me. Flop, flop. Flop, shop, shop, shop. What do you do at a green light? Good. Yeah. So some people, some people got it. Maybe they've heard this before. Maybe they're just really good at this. Um, but yeah, some people went to stop when at a green light you you do go. So do another one of these. Uh, poke, poke, poke. Folk, folk, folk. What do you call the white part of an egg? Oftentimes with these things, you get people who say stop or they say yolk. Um, and those are just patterns that I've, I've imprinted on your brains doing a little Jedi magic trick, for at least for some of you. Um, and this is a normal thing that our brains do. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And so get back to the PowerPoint. So we're talking about some different different parts of the brain and we're going to start with the reptilian brain so if you can see my cursor here this is one in red in the in the in the picture there and it comes off of your spinal cord and this is your brain stem your cerebellum and these are your just most basic life functions these are the things that happen autonomically so these are the things that you don't even think about you don't think about breathing you might sometimes but but you don't always have that going to your head. I need to breathe. I need to breathe. I need to breathe. If you had, you wouldn't be able to think about anything else. So these things happen automatically. Your heart rate, your body temperature, your sense of balance, these are things that, that are happening in what, in what people nickname the reptilian brain. And this is your most basic part of your brain. It's been around since the time of the reptile, since the time of the dinosaurs. This has been in, in the brains of living things for hundreds of millions of years. Um, and in our own development, that's the first thing to develop. You pop out of the womb and you can breathe. Your heart is beating. You're, you're a warm-blooded animal. These things are happening. So the next system that we're going to talk about is the limbic system. That's this, this orangish area that is just a little bit further out, and we're working our way out from the reptilian brain, away from that brain stem. And the limbic system is, it's the emotional headquarters of the brain. And these are things that typically happen on a subconscious level. Um, so a lot of emotions that you aren't necessarily thinking about and just immediately come into your brain. So an interesting thing here is that it is taking in tons and tons of information. It's taking in 2 million bits of information per second. So 2 million, 2 million, 2 million, 2 million. It's taking in temperature, taking in what does this person's voice sound like, look like? Uh, what's their head look like as it's bobbing around? What color are the walls? Uh, what are the noises that I'm hearing around me? A lot more, you know, 1.9 million more things per second that are coming into, into your brain. And it's taking in all this information and it's making, it's trying to recognize patterns within that. So some of the parts of the limbic system, we're going to have two slides. This is the first slide of the two. Some of those parts is, one of them is the amygdala. So these are two little almond, almond sized parts of your brain that are behind your eyeballs. And these are the centers of violence and aggression, 
fear and anxiety, worries. When you think about somebody having post-traumatic stress disorder, this is where that's happening. They've had a pattern of things that had threatened their survival that have imprinted on their brain. And now um, when something replicates that, they go into that, that PTSD feeling. Um, I was home in Ohio this last weekend with my dad and he was telling a story about one of his best friends after he came back from Vietnam, he'd seen a lot of combat and they were celebrating returning from the war and they were in Las Vegas. A loud noise went off in the hotel and he ducked under the table and you know was fully tensed up, ready to go. And that's, his, his amygdala was firing really hard at that time. Uh, and interesting about the amygdala is that you can train it. You can have these fears and anxieties and you can train it to not have those same stressors affect you in that same way. Um, you can change that post-traumatic stress into post-traumatic growth. And that's the way that anxiety works with, with this age group that we're talking with, that they may be finding ways, or that this is the way, this is the best way that you can do to uh, work with your anxiety. It's often recommended more so than medication and, and things of that nature. Um, I got a story of my own uh, kind of post-traumatic stress. I was, I was out on a course working in the canyons out here in Utah in the Slot Canyons, and I was scouting a canyon by myself. It was supposed to be a pretty straightforward canyon. I said I'd be back, you know, in a few hours, and I went in and I hit this spot. It was supposed to be completely dry, and, and I hit this spot where there's some water. And I start wading in, since it's supposed to be a completely dry canyon, I'm expecting it to be, you know, okay, maybe there's a little bit of rain and it'll go up to my knees or maybe go up to my waist. And it keeps on getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And I find myself swimming. And I've got a rope over one shoulder. I've got my backpack that I'm trying to keep dry. And I'm swimming. And I'm, I'm swimming for a long, long time, for a few hundred yards. And finally, I came up on these logs that were floating in there. Um, I, through my mind, I was thinking, do I just need to drop this rope, get myself back to where I can stand, and, you know, that we, we just won't have the rope for the rest of our section. Um, and I got there, I got to the end, and I was fine. I, I laid out in the sun, I warmed up. But now when I'm in canyons and I see deep water that I don't know the depths and I don't know how long it is, I feel this thing where my palms get sweaty, uh, where my heart rate rises, uh, I start to feel these things and I feel really uncomfortable and I don't really like being there. Um, we, we all have things that wire in our brains to the amygdala. You know, when you hear the music of Jaws, the da 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 you know that something scary is probably going to happen. Uh, your brain has recognized that pattern in the movie Jaws or in every scary movie. We have this, this sense that we know something's, something bad is going to be happen. The babysitter is by themselves, the power goes out, something bad is about to happen. Um, so that's a little bit about the amygdala. Uh, the hippocampus, that's, that's the spot that creates memories in your brain or the main location for that. And its main job is taking these short-term memories and converting them into long-term memories. So the hippocampus is, it is in this emotional headquarters of the brain. So it tends to tie these longer-term memories to emotions. If you think about some of your earliest memories, a lot of people's earliest memories tend to be uh, an emotional thing that was going on. Um, another interesting thing about the hippocampus is that um, there was a study that some neuro, neuroscientists did. They studied uh, the hippocampus size of some taxi drivers in London. So they took some taxi drivers that were just starting the job. They took some folks that were on the job for five years or 10 years, and then they took long time veteran drivers. So London isn't a grid system. It's not a super easy, place to get around and it's all these different names and they go off in every direction. 
And so it takes a lot of memory to remember these routes. And they noticed the, the veteran drivers had a larger hippocampus. The, the new folks that were starting had a much smaller hippocampus. And uh, the hippocampus has also been linked to, you know, when the hippocampus is atrophying, that's, that's what's often happening in uh, dementia when people are starting to lose their memories. Uh, the last part that I want to talk about in this emotional part of the brain um, is the hypothalamus. So this is the fight or flight. Um, you see something that's scary and your palms get sweaty, you clench your fists, your pupils dilate, uh, you start to, you, you stop salivating uh, and you get ready to fight or flight, your muscles tense up. So that's all happening. Adrenaline is being released, um, being triggered by the hypothalamus, and this is going off into your body. Adrenaline is, is here for a good reason. It's in these survival situations that happen. And it's really just in modern times that we've really been able to recreate these adrenaline thrill-seeking environments. On, on our own, you know, for pleasure. Uh, it's that sense of relief after you survive this death-defying thing. Um, so those are a few parts of the limbic system. And uh, I'm gonna show the next slide and, and, and here we go. So snake, this is a really common thing that your amygdala has some fears that are hardwired into it. Um, snakes, something most people, almost all people, tend to have an innate fear of snakes. So when they see this snake curled and, and ready to strike, they may start to have some of those things that, that trigger an emotional response. Um, this is something that Darwin studied. He studied these, these responses, these subconscious responses. He had a viper on the other side of a thick glass wall went to the zoo and put his face right in front of this viper and waited for it to strike. And he wanted to be able to, he wanted to be able to say, I'm not gonna blink, I'm not gonna jump back. Every time that it happened, he couldn't control it. It was hardwired into his brain, he couldn't stop that. There are things, like I said, we can train our brain other ways. Um, and Darwin also, uh, has had some, some great things. He also did some studies with three months old and six months old and put them in with these, these things that were culturally seen as very scary uh, to see their reactions with snakes and with spiders and other scary things. He learned fears are learned. Some are innate, but many are learned. For example, spiders, the, the small infants didn't have any, um, any natural fears to these, that these are cultural things that they were learning. So I got another, another picture that people tend to have a reaction to. So this is Alex Honnold. He's a couple thousand feet up Half Dome. He's on a ledge that's uh, you know, just, just about a foot wide, standing up, no rope. Uh, this is something that even as I'm talking, my palms are getting sweaty. Maybe you're seeing, having that same reaction. That's why this is such a, such a visceral photo here. Um, he's a master of the amygdala. He's been able to train his brain to shut down that worry and anxiety that happens in there. Um, and he's done that through thousands and thousands and thousands of routes of practice. And that's what it can take to rewire your brain is consistent, consistent practice. Um, moving on, we're going to talk a little bit more about the limbic system. We talked about some emotional fear-based parts of the system. Now we're going to talk about the pleasure zone. This is the fun stuff. This is the cake. This is the going skydiving, the adrenaline release. This is orgasms. This is uh, pleasurable drugs, things like that. And the limbic system is, a, or a few more parts of the pleasure zone that I want to talk about. One is this area called the ventral tegmental area. Um, and this is the place that produces dopamine. You may have heard of dopamine. It's a chemical within your brain and it's a chemical neurotransmitter. So a transmission travels along 
from neuron to neuron within your brain, sending these messages of pleasure. So when you get something pleasure, whether it's sugar or uh, you take, take a puff on a cigarette, these are things that this pleasure impulse goes out and it goes through your brain. And that's why um, dopamine is also intertangled with a lot of addiction. Cigarettes can be one of the hardest things to break uh, an addiction to, and that's because you get consistent time after time after again, dopamine is being released. Every time you take a puff, dopamine is being released. Every time you take a drink of coffee, it's being released, things like that. And one of the places that this dopamine goes to is the nucleus accumbens. And the nucleus accumbens works with your motor functions, and it links motor functions that results in dopamine release. So this is something that there have been neuroscientists have done studies uh, to see what happens in the brain when they get sugar or they have other pleasurable things. And they see a huge dopamine spike. And they even get to the point after they've built that pattern that they know what's pleasurable of, hey, that was good. I want some more of that. Even before they have it, they have that anticipation of rewards. And um, this is going to, we're going to come back to this. This goes into elevated risk taking to get more of that dopamine. Um, and if you think about it in an evolutionary standpoint, if you think about fatty foods or sugar foods or sex, um, that these things that help our species continue along. Um, so, so those fatty foods, high calories in a, in a quick bunch when you don't necessarily have a ton of food around, that's a great thing. It's a really good thing. I want some more of that. I want my brain to remember these good things to help me survive. I need to know the things that are going to kill me, and I need to know the things that are going to keep me alive. So that's, that's the, the theory around what dopamine has done. And the limbic system in total, uh, it fully matures around the age of 15. So just shortly after that onset of puberty, uh, when all of the hormones, the testosterone is starting to rage in our bodies. So, so we'll move on and do just a little bit of look at the neurons and how these places are maturing. So neurons in, in your brain are, they've got, let me move this screen around a little bit. So you've got, you've got millions and even billions of neurons in your brain that are transmitting these messages, whether it's dopamine, which tells you pleasure, or serotonin, which tells you calm, you're satisfied, you're satiated. Um, these are, and there's a a lot of different chemical neurotransmitters that are in your brain. But what happens is the chemical goes into these dendrites. Think of them as like little roots uh, that are trying to collect and grab onto these, these bits of dopamine. They go into, your, into, your, into that neuron, and then they go along this axon. So you can think of this axon as a slide. And in the immature brain, that slide is, you know, it's just a slide at the playground. Uh, maybe it's kind of even low angle and things move along. And, but as you build these things called myelin sheaths, they start to speed up and they start from that reptilian brain at the core and they start to work their way out. So they start at the reptilian brain, you build these pathways. Um, you can imagine it as being um, laying down pavement so that you can drive faster uh, instead of being on a dirt road. So they lay down these pathways and they speed things up. With these sheaths, information can travel 100 times faster and the neurons repair themselves 30 times faster so they're ready for the next neurotransmitter to come through. So it ends up being that they can process 3,000 times more information once these myelin sheaths have built up. So that playground slide, the low angle playground slide, you've just added water to it, you've steepened it, now you're going down the water slide here that's in the bottom right corner. Things are speeding up, it releases it out of the axon terminals and it goes to the next neuron. Uh, and these things ha happen fast. The senses that happen in your body 
from the moment that you touch something and you get that nerve ending, the sense it goes to your brain and it's processed in 0 0.04 seconds. That's, you know, that's, that's faster than I can snap my fingers. Um, these things are happening super fast. And um, in the brain during this adolescent time, some of these dendrites are, are getting pruned off. And they're not being cut off, but they're atrophying. You're not using them. Um, so the brain is figuring out what are the important parts, what are the important pathways, how do we continue those, how do we pave those to make it so that information travels faster and faster and faster. So by the age of 15, these myelin sheaths have worked their way through your limbic system, out from your reptilian brain, and things are moving fast, real fast, in, in that limbic system. So we've got... One more part of our, of our brain, so part of the neocortex, but I'm going to specifically talk about the prefrontal cortex. And if you can see my cursor, it's, it's the yellow section, but it's a section right in front. It's right behind the forehead. It's why we wear helmets, and we want to have them down low. We want to cover that part. This is the part that makes us human beings. Human beings have the largest prefrontal cortex in the animal world, and the only animals that have prefrontal cortex are primates. Uh, so this is something that really separates us out. And this is the rational headquarters of the brain. So the limbic system was our emotional headquarters. Here we're talking about the rational headquarters. And as you can see, it's, thing, it's planning our complex behavior. It's thinking about decision making. How can I take this past event apply it to the present circumstances, and how is that going to affect me in the future? What are those consequences going to be? Uh, it also moderates our social behavior. Things that are considered inappropriate, uh, it will tend to moderate. It'll be say, hey, you shouldn't do that. Um, like I said, looking at future consequences, goal setting, problem solving, um, and really looking at those, it weighs those short-term reward rewards that we can also call those oftentimes like impulsive behaviors versus the long-term goals that might be a career goal or five years from now I want to be in this position and, and doing that. So this section, the myelin sheaths following my cursor, they start in the reptilian brain. By age 15, they've really worked their way through the limbic system and by finally at age 25. So that, that's pretty old. And even there, you know, it does go beyond that. So some people even say into their young 30s, your brain is still developing. I can say personally, I've, I've noticed that. I've noticed that. I can look back on it and see that change. Um, and being in my mid-30s now, I, I can definitely see that, that stuff was still developing uh, in me personally in, into my young 30s for sure. Um, and that's, again, it's from those myelin sheaths coming out. So the prefrontal cortex is in place. Um, all of these parts are in place in your brain by about the time you're six. 95% of your brain is already in place by the time you're six. And so these abilities for problem solving and decision making and goal setting and things like that, those are abilities that are present within your brain but the speed hasn't caught up. So if you ask, if you give adolescents, young teens, things like that, an opportunity to think about what are the long-term consequences, what are the risks involved, they understand them. They can, they can definitely understand them. But we're going to talk a little bit about the imbalance in just a little bit. Um, and we'll talk right now just a little bit up about the prefrontal cortex a little bit more. Um, how are we doing? Any questions so far? Is this, is this making sense here? Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep on checking that chat box. If there are questions that you need me to revisit something, let me know. We will have a question and answer section at the end of this. Um, but just want to check kind of here. We're probably about two thirds of the way through here. So we've got a weather forecast. That's pretty easy understanding how that works, that um, 
you know, we're able to look at these weather forecasts and think, okay, definitely want to bring my rain jacket. Uh, it's going to be getting cold. I don't want to bring my summer bag. Uh, I want to have uh, a sleeping bag that's going to allow me to be nice and warm at night, things like that. So we can take the information that's given to us and use our prefrontal cortex to plan things out into the future. Um, next slide. So I'm going to give you just about eight seconds. I want you to count how many Fs are in blue. You're going to put that into the chat. Um, so eight seconds starting now. All right, we probably got a little bit more than eight seconds there. Let's see what we've got. Three, three, five, three, three, four, five, three, five. Okay, so this is a system. Your what your brain is doing is recognizing patterns. So I'm trying to replicate a little bit of the way the limbic system works, recognizing patterns. I asked you to look for the Fs, and we will. Click on to the next one where I've highlighted them. So there's six of them. So we missed, people missed some in there. And as you can see in red, the thing that typically trips people up is this of, that sound, because that's a, that sounds more like a V sound. But our brains have recognized the pattern of the F sound, like in fuel and fire and flame. Um, Apparently, I'm on, on a fire kick right now. Um, and we just we just look for those Fs. So that's where a lot of those threes came in. Or some people noticed they they started to notice those Fs. But if you just look for this, the way that the F looks, finding a different pattern, it's easier to pick up on those six. Uh, get another thing. So back to that snake picture. And your initial limbic reaction is going to be fear. Uh, you're going to back away. Your fists are going to clench. Your pupils are going to dilate. You're going to be startled. But you might spend some more time. This is where the prefrontal cortex can click in. And you might notice, hey, like when I look at that, the tail of this, it, it doesn't have a, rat, a rattle on it. And when I look at the head, the pit vipers, the rattlesnakes that are in the American West, the venomous snakes, they've got a real diamond-shaped head that this snake doesn't have. So it, it does look like a snake, and its pattern is similar to a rattlesnake, but I can use my prefrontal cortex, my rational thoughts, and I can realize, hey, this actually isn't a threat. You don't need to have that survival, life-threatening reaction that your body's doing. And your prefrontal cortex can tell your emotional brain, hey, calm down, you're going to be OK. So that's something that is happening with us. Fears come, come out, and, and as we, being older, we're able to look at these, and we're able to, to act on them better. Our prefrontal cortex has got that speed by the age of 25. Those myelin sheaths have gone out. So just a few uh, brain, but also bodily developments, like I said, most of your brain is in place. Um, by age 10, females have the onset of puberty. They're starting to release greater amounts of estrogen. Uh, two years later, males typically hit their puberty and a uh, great rise in testosterone. Um, this leads to a lot of impulsive behaviors and a lot of social consciousness or relationship consciousness starts to rise. And um, the, the threats of, of being, being out in front of your peers becomes bigger, um, or being on stage can be bigger. Uh, by age 15, that limbic system has reached maturity. The myelin sheaths are firing. Pathways are really fast. Your brain has been pruning path pathways that aren't being used, um, and you're adapting to a lot of things really quickly. Your dopamine production goes up which is your pleasure, like this feels good, give me some more, that goes up. When, when you get that, like I mentioned earlier with the sugar, 
you want more of it even before you've had it. You want more dopamine. It's a good thing. It feels good. Um, at the same time, during the adolescence years, your serotonin goes down. Uh, so this is the thing that makes you feel saturated, feel calm and good. These things go down. So this is going to lead to you want more good things and oftentimes risk-taking behavior can be a good thing because it gives this feel of adrenaline, this rush and the relief of I'm alive. Um, but you keep on getting more and more and you don't have the same amount of serotonin that tells you, cool, I'm good. Like I'm full. I, I don't need to eat a third cheeseburger. Um, and you've got this period, 10 years, where the prefrontal cortex doesn't come into full maturity. So we've got this imbalance in our brains. And I'll let you, I'll let you read it. Um, it says what, what you need to know there. So this is that, that issue that in the past, before 10 or 15 years ago, when we started studying the brain through the magnetic resonance imaging, people were asking, why aren't these teens using their brains? This goes back, you can read in Shakespeare uh, in, the, in the 16th century, that they were, what is the deal with this, these people in this age group from you know, 13 to 22? What is the deal? And it's not that they weren't using their brains. They are using their brains. They've just got different brains. Um, so we've got this imbalance where the limbic is firing really fast, really fast, getting a lot of rewards for what it's doing. And then the prefrontal cortex is going slowly until age 25 when they start working together. Uh, and they can work together so that you're not having these irrational emotional responses. Uh, I, like, I like that photo a lot. So to, to restate some of the things here, so what the, the researchers have been finding is the increased hormone production re results in an elevated emotional volatility and increase in impulsivity. And um, this is something, there's a lot of studies that, that as you enter adolescence, you, your conflicts with your parents tend to rise. I think that we, you know, that probably doesn't surprise any of us. And um, having that emotional volatility, more physical fights, things like that that are happening at those times. Uh, you, you also, as an adolescent, have an increased sensitivity to peers being around, whether or not they're actually pressuring you, explicitly giving you peer pressure just them being around increases your likelihood to take risks. There's studies where people have been, they set up a brain imaging and they have them driving a, a simulated car and when they're by, their set, by themselves, they do, you know, they perform at a baseline and then you add peers in who aren't even talking but they're just in the room with them and things start to spike up. When you look at the data, AAA, the insurance company put together data about 16 to 17 year olds and having uh, you know, them by themselves, the likelihood of, of having a fatal car accident. You add one, one other person who's under the age of 21, that goes up by more than 40%. You add two, that likelihood of having a fatal accident doubles. You add three or more that are under 21, it quadruples. So having peers around, definitely increases likelihood to engage in risk-taking activities. Um, oh, if you add someone who's over 35, the likelihood of death decreases. Um, so, and adults don't have that same thing. You put in adult peers or adults with younger folks in the car and those rates stay pretty much constant. They don't change a whole lot. Um, there's also an increased sensitivity to rewards. So where kids, you know, under 10 or 12, maybe this is their level of sugar. This is what dopamine gets released for sugar. And this is the level that adults get. But your adolescence, during these times, they've got this increased sensitivity. So sugar, the same good thing that we're all producing dopamine for, they're coming way up here and they're getting a lot more. 
they're getting an increased sensitivity to it, it feels better than it feels to kids or to adults. Um, so they've built that pattern recognition of this is a good thing, I want more of it. Adrenaline is a good thing, I want more of it. Let me do it more, let me do it more. Uh, and leads to that heightened risk taking, things like driving dangerously, binge drinking, um, smoking cigarettes, trying drugs, casual sex, uh, violent acts, criminal acts, things like that. Uh, in short, adolescents understand the risks, yet they consistently overestimate the rewards. This is, this is if you bo boil it down into one sentence, what happens, this is what it is. In short, adolescents understand the risks, yet consistently overestimate the rewards. Um, in the interest of time, I had a couple of videos. They're videos of, of the TV show Jackass. Um, and in, these, in both of these scenes, the folks know this is dumb, this is, this is dangerous, it doesn't sound good. And then they play tetherball with a beehive. Um, they you know, get shot down ramps, um, things like that. So we'll just save a little bit of time. Feel free, if you aren't familiar with Jackass, um, YouTube it. It's, it's a bunch of males in their late adolescence doing really ridiculous things um, that they are well aware of that they are dangerous, but that they're overestimating those rewards. So how do we mitigate these things? Um, so now we know what the problem is, so what do we do? Do we eliminate all risk? You could, but that, that might be part of the problem also. Um, so there's some theories out there that, um, that the amount of, of freedom that folks, that adolescents have had has decreased rapidly and incredibly over the last several hundred years. And a study realize that there's about 10 times the restrictions on adolescents or on teenagers than there are on adults. Uh, there's twice as many restrictions on teenagers as there are incarcerated felons. Um, so these are folks that have had, they can't do this, they can't do that. People are trying to eliminate risk. And, and that make, the theory is that maybe that's what makes them want it more. Um, that's a theory, it's hard to fully do tests on that. So it doesn't necessarily have the scientific uh, data to back it up. Um, so some things that you can do is allow them to engage in this risk taking activity. It's why we do the, the things that, that most of us do, working at outdoor programs or climbing walls, um, uh, why we work uh, in the outdoors and, and with these different folks. Um, and allow them to have risk. Risk has an inherent value. Uh, former director of the Heinz Institute in Leadville, Colorado said something along the lines of success without the risk and potential of failure is not success at all. It's something that's worthless. Um, so if we can create situations with a high perceived risk where they're getting this risk taking uh, desire satisfied, the dopamine is going crazy in their brains, but we can mitigate the risk, we can put in safety measures, we can put the helmet on, we can put them, we can have a redundant anchor, we can do these things to make it so that it's actually safer. Christopher Barnes also looked at some information where he looked at top rope climbing, which is largely seen as a, a risky activity amongst folks that are outside of the industry. He looked at the actual accident rates, cheerleading twice as dangerous, soccer four times as dangerous as as top rope climbing and likelihood for accidents within those. So allowing for risk, implementing risk, and even if you can see in this graph, there's ways that things that we can do, how do we take this activity that isn't a very risky thing, how can we bump it up um, to have that peak experience? And um, this is where that hippocampus, forming those longer term memories, and it's tied in with the emotions. How do we create something that is perceived riskier so that it forms those memories so that we can fulfill our missions and our goals um, while keeping folks safe? So some other, so other ways to do this, provide opportunities for novelty and displays of competency. Uh, so this is giving uh, independent travel or 
independent cooking or different what things that people can do on their own without having someone constantly over their over their heads. And that novelty thing, that that idea of like, oh, I'm doing the same thing that people did a week ago, and you know, really, I'm just running through running through this same process that everybody else has. If you can find that way to make it like, this is unique, this is raw, and this is honest, and this is something that only you are ever going to be able to experience. Having that increases that buy-in, and it also makes it seem like there is actual risk, and you need to perform at the top of your game. And so, Adolescents are extraordinarily competent, even if they don't always express that competence, they are. They, you look at studies, their intelligence levels on, on measured tests is higher than adults. Um, their ability to uh, have a higher memory recall is higher than adults. They've got these things that are really high performing and they may not be performing at their potential. So giving them that time when they are performing on their own. We can help them build safe habits. If it's at the climbing wall, we have them climb with helmets on, uh, learn proper procedures, and learn safe habits to resolve conflict with one another. And these are things that we can do to help our students so that when they leave our program or leave our climbing wall and start doing these things on their own, they've got those safe habits that they can take. So they'll be less likely to engage in the same type of risky behavior. Um, chunking large projects and long-term goals into short-term accomplishments and progressions. We do this all the time. Down in the Everglades, when I'm working for Outward Bound down there, on the last day, students are often paddling 10 miles in the dark. Night has fallen through the Everglades, through the 10,000 islands. And they're able to do it. They're able to navigate their whole way by map, by chart and compass. Uh, whereas on day one, they they certainly wouldn't have been able to do it. They have a hard time going straight. So we focus on building those skills bit by bit by bit. And the same thing can happen in the classroom, taking a large project and breaking it down. Um, so this is this next one: creating opportunities among staff to predict temptations that might happen on course. What are the things that people are going to do and how do we be proactive about them rather than reactive? Um, this is something that with my staff here in, in Utah, I'll have them build cairns and each rock stands for a temptation that they might expect. Uh, you know, on, on their solo experience, students might try and talk with each other and uh, there might be sexual encounters on course or that temptation for it. So how do we on day one or, or as, as course is going on predict each day? Um, and so we'll have these rock cairns and I'll have my staff have a throw bag and a safety device used on rivers and they're going to throw and aim for that rock cairn. So they're practicing their technical skills at the same time. Um, but they're as they say that, they're saying a way that they're going to mitigate that thing, and they're going to help to prevent this. Um, we've had a lot of really good success doing this, both at the beginning, of course, in these briefings, but then using something called a guides meeting, where they go through all the hazards each morning. Um, what are the subjective hazards? What are the objective hazards? You can practice, moving on to the, to the last one on that page, you can practice action, What's the consequence going to be? You can map that out. Um, this next page has just a little way. This is talking about um, a school that changing. They're thinking about how, how would they affect their parking space? If they're going to build new parking, this or that. If they make up, if they make a massive parking lot, it's going to cover up area for deer to browse. And then if they cover up the deer, the bobcat won't have or they cover up the food for the deer, the deer aren't gonna be there, and then the bobcats won't have anything to consume uh, other than rabbits, and then the rabbit population is gonna go down. Okay, what's another consequence of this? And doing this, uh, I've had really great success on course doing this, um, and it helps people who have that difficulty thinking, I do this, what's the long-term consequence? It can help them fast forward so that they can build those pathways to their prefrontal cortex of this, 
leads to that, leads to this over here. Um, so this has been something that's been really helpful, um, whether it's getting a piece of paper out and doing this mapping or just going bit by bit. Helps folks empathize with others. And, and really, it, one of the biggest ways with these emotional risks that we encounter. And um, so it's not all things that like, you know, this, this adolescent imbalance that's happening in their brain, it's not all the bad things. And um, there are good things that come out of this. It's not just heightened risk taking and all these, these risk factors. There is also that pruning that happens. It allows for higher adaptability and growth in new technologies. We can all think of, you know, new technology comes out and the 14 year old knows how to use the iPhone better than the adult. And, you know, even six year olds are, are doing that. And they're more likely to engage in new social situations, meeting new people, learning new languages. Their brain has this, this larger net and plasticity that can change and really adapt to what's coming up in the world. And this is one of our jobs as educators. What are people, what, it's not what people needed 20 years ago, but what do people need going forward? Uh, and this really moldable brain at the adolescent time, emotions are, are running high and long-term memories are that ability to peak there. Um, we can help them go out of their comfort zones and um, time of great growth potential. Um, creativity is less inhibited by the prefrontal cortex. Um, these abilities in emotionally safe situations, people, people will be adolescents that have more creative ideas as long as they're not feeling like they're going to be presenting in front of all of their peers. Um, so harness it. It's a great opportunity. Um, there's also that great desire to interact with peers. That's the higher risk taking. Their dopamine levels go up when they're around their peers. These are, these are things. Don't fight that. Um, don't fight it all the time. Develop projects that can challenge students and allow them to work with others, um, whether it's two people or five people or 10 people, and finding those ways for them to work towards a authentic challenge. And we have the opportunity to leverage emotional events into positive learning events. These emotional events are being transferred into the hippocampus and they're creating lifelong memories. So if emotional events are happening on course and say you've got, you know, you're in lightning drill for half an hour in the mountains or in the desert or wherever you are. Um, and that can be an emotional event. But if you can take that, time when the limbic system's running on high because it's worried about its own survival, you can imprint positive patterns on that. Um, some of the most impactful moments happen during these emotional events. That's why we're in this field oftentimes. Uh, and just a, a couple more things is looking at positive reinforcement, um, especially of value traits. So again, emotional center is in overdrive, it's going crazy. We can help imprint these positive things on them. And it's not about saying, oh, Susie, you did really good, uh, you did really good on that geometry test. You're good at geometry. The difference, the way to use values is this idea called DVT. Um, and describe what they did. You did really good on this geometry test. And then you want to put in that human value that is transferable outside of just geometry. It's clear that you studied a lot. You had great persistence, uh, even though this is a challenging subject for you. You stayed optimistic. Um, and I'm excited to see how that affects or how you're able to use that in future science and math courses or classes. And lastly, again, this emotional system is in overdrive and appreciations. Giving appreciation, being grateful for what you have, doing this on a daily basis, every time you appreciate, dopamine's being released into your brain. Whether you're a, a child, adolescent, adult, these things happen when you're grateful. Um, so incorporate that into your, in, into your staff, into your students, things like that. And doing service for each other, uh, or doing service for each other, uh, or for the environment and things like that. Uh, as you can see, empirically, Doing a kindness to others produces the single most reliable momentary increase in well-being of any exercise tested. So that's that dopamine being released 
And when people have that, that pattern of I do this and I get dopamine, if you can build that pattern of service to each other and being compassionate to each other, you can help to build those positive patterns and, and we can leverage that emotional system that is in overdrive. So how are we doing on time? Let's see. The time is, okay, we're I'm running over a little bit. Um, we're just gonna, we're gonna return to that Google Doc and using those ideas that I was throwing out there, um, I want you to be able to apply some solutions to some different people's professions. So that's why I wanted people to put in their professions um, and come up with some, some ways to tackle that, that particular issue and give some folks some different ideas uh, with some of those um, solutions, ways to mitigate or to leverage. So I'll go back to those pages and then in give you a moment to look at them again and then in about 30 seconds or a minute we'll go back to the Google Doc page and you can add um, some of those potential solutions for people in outside professions and things like that. All right, so looks like um, on Adam's issue of unclipping lobster claws, just doing a little consequence mapping, talking beforehand, maybe with a whiteboard or something like that, uh, having that ability to, if you do this, what are the potential consequences? Um, and that should be a, a pretty straightforward thing. It becomes pretty apparent and they come up with those consequences. It's not the staff member or the instructor telling them exactly what to do. Um, this is great. Keep on, keep on adding into these. Um, let's see. Um, looks like for uh, people being really excited about their ropes course or the rock wall, breaking things down, uh, chunking them down. Um, we're also seeing uh, for Sarah's issue of, of people wanting to do Aussie repels, putting in a chest harness makes it impossible to do that. Um, and or, you know, finding a way that maybe there is a way to do the Aussie repel while still be clip, being clipped in in a way that is safe. Um, and so maybe not explicitly eliminating risk, but finding a way to, to proactively manage it. Um, why aren't teenagers, adolescents using their brains? They are, they're, they're just brains that are different from ours. There's an imbalance in how fast these parts of the brain are understanding risk. Um, and that imbalance leads to, leads to they, they do understand the risks, yet they consistently overestimate the rewards. Um, and lastly, these things are ways to empathize with our, with our students. Um, there are opportunities for us to mitigate the risks so that they can still engage in, in high perceived risk. Um, and then that we can leverage these imbalances. It's not, the imbalance isn't, isn't inherently a bad thing. That, that can just be the way that we choose to see it and that we can leverage it to be a positive thing. And um, put up just a few resources um, that helped me along. And there's tons of resources. You know, this is this is probably five percent, ten percent of the things that I've looked at and that have helped my understanding of the adolescent brain and helped me in my role to have safer courses. Um, it has been really good to see incident rates decreasing um, year by year. Um, but this TED Talk is phenomenal by Sarah Jane Blakemore. Uh, that's, that's what initially sparked me on this. Um, Scientific American just recently came out with an article is pretty much the exact, exact title of my presentation that I was like, oh, I came up with this presentation a few years ago. And it's cool to see that you know, in other places. And Lauren Steinberg uh, released a book last year that has a lot of good opportunities. What are those? positives that can come out of this imbalance. Um, but just type in adolescent brain development and, and a lot of things are gonna pop up. Thank you very much. And if there aren't any other questions, um, have a great day, have a great week, and hopefully I'll see you next week at the conference up in Portland. Thanks a lot, bye.